Hi, everyone. This is Erica Mejia for Brainwaves. Thanks for listening. This week, we're going to start off the episode with a story brought to you by Dr. Zachary Newcomer from the University of Florida. Sarah was a 72-year-old woman who moved into a nursing home in Liverpool by her eldest daughter the preceding year. She had suffered from mild but progressive memory loss for two years before receiving a formal diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease at age 69. A retired primary school teacher, Sarah had lived semi-independently in a crofter next door to her supportive daughter and son-in-law, their two boys, and Scottish Fold, who went by the name of John Lennon, JL for short. By age 69, she was found wandering the roads of Liverpool at night, which led her to her first encounter with a neurologist. The diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease was obvious, and she was started on Denepizo. Eventually, Sarah's daughter moved her out of the crofter and into the second floor bedroom of her townhome. But Sarah continued to wander the medium-sized house at night, confused as to where she should go or what it was she thought she should be doing. Sarah's daughter grew concerned about these nocturnal wanderings and feared her mother might fall down the stairs or make her way back onto the streets of Liverpool at night. She asked the neurologist what could be done, and the neurologist recommended a low-dose medication for sleep, Risperdone. Sarah's daughter was informed of the risks of the medications, dry mouth, weight gain, blurred vision, and then there was this reportedly increased risk of dying with the medication when used specifically in elderly patients with dementia, which was supposed to be small. But the neurologist said she had good experience with using the drugs on patients like Sarah. Reluctantly, Sarah's daughter agreed. Within a few days, Sarah was getting more regular sleep, she was no longer wandering at night, and all seemed well. Maybe it was just a phase, she thought to herself. A year later, Sarah was moved into an assisted living facility. She was still taking the Denepazo and Risperdone, as well as treatments for her arthritis and hypertension. At follow-up with the neurologist, Sarah's daughter mentioned the nighttime confusion and wonderings had all but resolved, and she inquired as to whether the drug was needed anymore at all. Her mother was under direct supervision and could not wander the facility at night after all. Then there was also this slight increased risk of dying with the treatment. The neurologist cautioned that Sarah's nocturnal confusion could return if the medication were stopped, but said it could be done. There is a trial, the neurologist mentioned. We are studying the safety of discontinuing these kinds of medications in patients like Sarah. We could roll her in that, she suggested. After a brief discussion, Sarah's daughter consented, and Sarah was randomized to either continuing the medication or to continuing a placebo, which meant no sleep medication. Over the next three months, things seemed to be going well for Sarah at the assisted living facility. She was participating in daytime activities, taking visitors during the evening and on weekends, eating well. Then one day, Sarah's daughter received a phone call. I regret to inform you that your mother passed away last night, the nursing supervisor said. She was found in her bed during a morning check-in and seemed comfortable. We have moved her body into the south wing of the hospital and can assist with mortuary arrangements. These words seemed to dissolve over the telephone line. Sarah's daughter was beside herself. She couldn't believe it. The neurologist's office called after Sarah did not make her scheduled follow-up appointment. When Sarah's daughter answered, she asked if the sleep medication could have contributed. Did my mother keep getting the study drug? Did she die because of it? In 2009, the results of the DART AD trial were published in Lancet, that randomized placebo controlled trial of antipsychotic withdrawal in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Of the 128 patients who received the antipsychotic or placebo, there was a 30% greater chance of dying in the next 12 months among patients like Sarah, who continued the antipsychotic. 30%. By three years, only one out of three patients survived if they were randomized to the antipsychotic versus 59% who survived on placebo. Now, I'll be honest, Sarah's case was fictionalized, but it was based in truth. It's because of data like what was presented in the DART-80 trial that we should be concerned with prescribing antipsychotics for patients with dementia. But does that stop us from doing it? Should it stop us from doing it? Welcome back to Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine and all the fascinating science and history that come with it. I'm Jim Siegler, and in this week's installment, we'll discuss two major complications of neurologic treatments, complications that we are explicitly warned about when prescribing medications, black box warnings. 
why these medications are prescribed, what it is about these drugs that result in such disastrous consequences, and how to mitigate the risk of medical legal liability. I'm feeling a bit inspired by Ira Glass today, so we'll be dividing our program this week into three parts. Part one, shake on it. Part two, death be not loud. And part three, your love is my drug. Stay with us. Part one, shake on it. You've heard these commercials before. Pharmaceutical ads which spend 10 seconds addressing the symptoms they're trying to treat. Is FDA approved to help adults who are overweight or struggle with obesity? And then the remainder of the ad describing a laundry list of risks and side effects. Serious side effects are mood changes like depression and mania, seizures, increased blood pressure or heart rate, liver damage, glaucoma, allergic reactions, and hypoglycemia. I mean, so many warnings. Blood pressure, seizure history, anorexia, bulimia, drug or alcohol withdrawal. Seriously though, is all this necessary? May cause nausea, constipation, headache, and vomiting. Reduce hunger. Some of these are just warnings, just mild, bothersome side effects with any sort of treatment. And some are more concerning. The black box warnings. You too. Eliquis can cause serious and in rare cases fatal bleeding. Don't or do thoughts of suicide. Some people may have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, bruising, or not sleep well. Some have an increased risk of death. Call your doctor right away if you, if you have fever, stiff muscles, and confusion. And it may take longer than usual for bleeding to stop. Talk to your doctor about Alzheimer's treatments, including Aracet. Ask your doctor about adding Seroqual XR today. What's around the corner could be surprising. Now, just because a drug has a black box warning, it doesn't mean the drug is not effective or even safe for the treatment of a medical condition. The FDA would have taken it off the market if it weren't. As you know, a black box warning, or a box warning, is simply a safety measure intended to remind the provider of the risks of this treatment, and that the provider should weigh the potential benefits of treatment against those risks. Technically, there are three reasons that the Food and Drug Administration will assign a boxed warning to the package insert for a medication. First, the drug is known to cause a serious adverse reaction that, while it may be rare, is so deleterious as to outweigh any potential benefits of the drug. For example, alemtuzumab, a powerful MS therapeutic, has a boxed warning that tells users that they're at an increased risk of cervical artery dissection, ischemic stroke, and intracerebral hemorrhage. Second, There's a known adverse reaction to the drug when used inappropriately. For example, in patients with chronic kidney disease, or patients who are also taking another medication that may interact with it. There's a boxed warning indicating a higher risk of major bleeding in patients over the age of 65 while on warfarin. And lastly, of the three FDA criteria, a boxed warning can be applied when the FDA approved the use of a drug only under specific circumstances, such that should those circumstances be breached, there's thought to be a serious adverse reaction. In the first chapter of our program, I'm going to talk about tetrabenazine. For those who have prescribed it, you know tetrabenazine is a highly effective and remains the only approved therapy for the treatment of Huntington disease symptoms. The vesicular monoamine transport inhibitor was clinically proven in the 2006 Tetra-HD randomized clinical trial by the Huntington Study Group, to significantly reduce the Korea subscore of the unified Huntington disease rating scale. However, it came at a potential cost. Among the 54 patients randomized to the tetrabenazine arm, one committed suicide, and another had serious suicidal ideations. Nobody in the placebo arm had these. While definitely concerning, a serious adverse event rate of 2 for suicidal thoughts or behaviors could have totally been coincidental. As a matter of fact, according to data from the registry investigators of the European Huntington's Disease Network, including over 2,000 patients with the HD mutation, the prevalence of suicidal ideation was 8%, 1 in 12 patients, with a 1 in 10 chance that any one patient over a four-year period would develop suicidal thoughts, irrespective of treatment with tetrabenazine. Then there was another observational cohort from the US and Australia in which 5% of patients with HD had at least one suicide attempt prior to enrollment. And you can find these references in the show notes. 
the association between tetrabenazine and suicidality has been challenged in several observational studies since that 2006 report. One cohort out of Baylor, including 145 treated patients over a mean of three years, reported no suicides. In a more recent paper, published by Schultz and colleagues in Neurology in 2018, these investigators pulled from the Multicenter Observational Enroll HD Registry, and they evaluated the risk of suicidality in over 4,000 patients, 543 of whom were treated with tetrabenazine. Now, I'll preface this discussion with the fact that this was a controversial paper, and it has many limitations. Nevertheless, what the authors found was that the incidence rate of suicide was significantly lower among tetrabenazine users than non-users, a 39% reduction in the odds of dying by suicide. This was driven by the patients who had a history of comorbid depression, where tetrabenazine was associated with a significant 43% reduction in suicide. Some things are worth mentioning here. Like I said before, this was an observational study, so it lacks the advantage of a randomized trial design, like TetraHD, where patients would be allocated to treatment rather than followed based on the clinical decision-making of the neurology provider. A provider could have very well recommended against tetrabenazine if they were worried that that patient would be at a greater risk of suicide, potentially biasing those data. Or it could have been that the patient or caregiver expressed concern regarding that box warning for suicide. It's entirely possible that these, quote, higher-risk patients would not have been offered tetrabenazine, and therefore patients who were not given tetrabenazine were naturally going to be at a greater risk of suicide. Additionally, as was pointed out in a response by Sampaio and colleagues, there's a potential survivor bias that would have resulted in a protective effect of tetrabenazine. What I mean by this is that only patients who tolerated tetrabenazine or were continued on it, these were the patients who were classified as tetrabenazine users. Those who could not tolerate it, or who may have expressed more depression or suicidal ideation, those patients were discontinued from treatment and they were classified as non-users. So maybe there was an interaction between this suicidal risk and discontinuation of treatment. The bottom line here is, I think that the jury is still out as to whether tetrabenazine truly contributes to the risk of suicidal ideation or behavior. Huntington disease is a fatal, progressive, neurodegenerative condition with a high suicide rate regardless of treatment. And thus far, some of the best data we have that links tetrabenazine to suicide is from that 84-patient TetraHD study, in which there was one suicide of the 54 patients randomized to tetrabenazine. Until we have more definitive data, and in order to remain compliant with FDA recommendations, we can at least acknowledge this risk, whether there is a biological reason for it or clinical evidence to support it. And in the meantime, now you know the data between the suicide box warning for tetrabenazine, and you can reference it when discussing it with your patients. Part 2. Death Be Not Loud A 78-year-old woman with moderate Alzheimer's disease is referred to your clinic for evaluation. She's been started on Dinepazil and Mamantine. She takes lisinopril for hypertension, and she has no other comorbidities. You learn from her son, who's her primary caregiver, that she's had memory impairment for the preceding five years, and in recent months, she's been wandering the house in the middle of the night. She's also had well-formed visual hallucinations, and she can become quickly combative around some family members. She has not responded to redirection, optimization of sleep-wake cycles, and her son is growing stressed. He's having trouble at work, having trouble with other family members, and he wants some help. So you check an EKG on your Alzheimer's patient, and the QTC interval is 460 milliseconds. So you recommend low-dose quetiapine, 25 milligrams nightly. You instruct the son that he's allowed to up-titrate it by 25 milligram increments every three or four days, up to a maximum of 100 milligrams nightly in order to help her sleep and reduce periods of agitation. This scenario sounds familiar, right? Prescribing an antipsychotic for psychomotor agitation, hallucinations, and to help with the sleep-wake entrainment in a patient who has cognitive impairment or dementia? Maybe you'll be surprised to learn that no single antipsychotic drug has been approved by the FDA for the treatment of behavioral symptoms in patients with cognitive impairment. In fact, the FDA has issued a black box warning for this indication, citing an increased risk of aspiration pneumonia, seizures, and even death, as we mentioned before, in patients who are given an antipsychotic who have dementia. And it was from all number of causes. This is Dr. Mike Rubenstein, one of the producers of the show. 
We just happened to be at his place discussing a legal case when I was putting together this program. So it was not just a cardiac death or stroke or aspiration. It was a number of things, and it was extremely small. In case you so might be wondering, patient, what is the magnitude of the effect here? What is the actual risk of death with atypical neuroleptics in demented patients? I can tell you that there are a number of observational studies and clinical trials out there on the subject. It is not a disputed fact. According to one meta-analysis that was published in JAMA in 2005, including data from 15 of these randomized placebo-controlled trials using antipsychotics for the treatment of dementia, three trials of which included quetiapine, there was a 1% increase in the absolute chance of dying over the study period with an antipsychotic. On average, this was a period of about three months. The numbers were 3.5% for the antipsychotic arm and 2.3% for the placebo arm. And that may seem like a small number to you, but put another way, patients who were treated with an antipsychotic were at a 54% greater relative risk of dying than if they had received placebo. 54%. But this 1% absolute difference is much less impressive than the results of the DART AD trial, as we discussed earlier, in which 30% of patients survived three years on antipsychotics, while 60% survived three years off of them. So the range of the effect, the confidence interval, it's a little variable, but the effect does seem to be real. And large effect or not, I leave it up to you to decide, is it worth it? And when is it worth it? Alzheimer's disease has devastated millions of lives. Often, considering the benefits of delirium control, improved sleep, and improved quality of life of the patients and their caregivers, or easing the burden for all those many providers, like Dr. Rubenstein, will go for it. I have had virtually all families choose to use atypical neuroleptics in those situations and that we felt that it was uh, significant from a quality of life issue. Part 3. Your love is my drug. I want to make a distinction. We need to recognize the difference between the two other FDA levels of concern. In addition to a box warning, which is what we've been talking about, there are standard warnings or precautions, and then there are contraindications. I bring this up because they all seem kind of fuzzy to me, and I think it's important to understand why they must be differentiated. You would think that they may be graded with regard to severity or duration of consequences, but they're not. Simply put, a box warning refers to information that the FDA deems essential for providers to consider when prescribing a medication. Basically, black box warnings are saying to a doctor, Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, Will Robinson, danger. So, box warnings are really what the FDA expects providers and prescribers to know and to share with their patients. Like suicide risk in tetrabenazine users, or death from any cause in patients who are prescribed an antipsychotic. Any antipsychotic. And uh, those medications, as a class, all have black box warnings. Next. A contraindication, you might expect, is a patient-level factor that is known to significantly increase the risk of a medication or intervention without a commensurate benefit. Therefore, the drug should not be given to that patient. The consequences are far more severe than what you would see in a box warning, where the benefit is possible and treatment should still be considered. Take for example sumatriptan, which is contraindicated in a patient who has known coronary artery disease. Myocardial ischemia is a life-threatening and a not terribly unexpected consequence of taking a triptan. Sure, you might help the migraine, but the risks vastly outweigh any benefits if you know the patient's already at risk of having a heart attack. So, contraindicated. And lastly, of the three tiers of the FDA alerts, a warning or a precaution refers to adverse reactions with reasonable evidence of a causal association, or reactions that may require discontinuation or reactions that interfere with a laboratory test, like serotonin syndrome in sumatriptan users. A rare risk, but it's a risk where the benefits are still considerable. Or a warning for arrhythmia or myocardial ischemia. You can see here that there's often an overlap between contraindications and warnings. For sumatriptan, it's contraindicated in patients who have known prior coronary artery disease, like I mentioned already. But the warning for patients is that it can cause complications of coronary artery disease. The difference is, and this is kind of semantics, if you have CAD, the FDA says, nah. If you don't, then just be aware that this drug may unmask some silent CAD. Mm -hmm. 
Next, how do you get around these warnings and these risks? Probably the most important question we're going to ask today. As providers, we hold the patient's health and quality of life in the highest regard. How does one weigh the risk of death in demented patients on antipsychotics? And how do we obviate that risk as prescribers? In such a litigious society, how is it possible to avoid malpractice lawsuits after prescribing a medication where, stamped on the medication is a statement, you are at an increased risk of death? Let's start by defining medical legal liability. To be liable for negligence, the plaintiff, meaning your patient or the patient's representative, must establish beyond a reasonable doubt that the provider did not offer a generally accepted standard of care and that failure to provide that standard of care resulted in patient harm. This is what's referred to as the reasonable physician standard. Would a reasonable physician have found your treatment plan unreasonable? In these instances, to prove that your thought process was reasonable, you must demonstrate competence in decision-making, and you must demonstrate that you've consented the patient to the risks and benefits of treatment. Publishing a dozen papers on the use of sumatriptan in migraine patients will not indemnify you from legal proceedings after your patient has a heart attack. I hate to say it, but documentation of your thought process and the consent process is critical, even for something as relatively benign as to pyramate for Tourette syndrome. Here's Dr. Rubenstein again. In liability issues, the most important thing is to document your thought processes in the decisions that you make. Bottom line, if you don't document it, it didn't happen. Initially, the initial complaint was that they had given the guy way too much narcotics and that he had... It's your word against theirs. And this is what the plaintiff is saying happened. And it's always better if you have proof. That's what the lawyers will tell you. In cases where the provider is treating a patient off-label, for example, using an antipsychotic to treat delirium in a demented patient, the water is even murkier. Your decision-making is even less tenable in these circumstances. But there are a few caveats. First, the FDA cannot keep you or any other provider from prescribing medications off-label. By definition, off-label refers to the use of a medication in a patient or condition for which it is not FDA-approved. So go ahead. Give your patient with neurosarcoidosis adalimumab if you think it's going to help them. Second, graduating a drug from off-label to indicated, this is not as common as you might think. Once a drug begins to accumulate anecdotal and observational evidence of efficacy, and it becomes increasingly utilized in an off-label manner for a given population, what is there to drive the drug company to fund a costly and risky clinical trial? Why do this if prescribers believe it to work already and they're prescribing it? Best case scenario, you prove that the off-label use of your medication is effective and it becomes indicated by the FDA. But worst case scenario, you waste millions and millions of dollars only to find out your medication may not work or its efficacy may not be as impressive. Or worse, it causes more harm than benefit. Cause serious and in rare cases fatal bleeding. Don't take so many warnings. Some people may have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, bruising, or not sleep well. Some people the benefits have to outweigh the risks. Have an increased risk of death. And if you discuss that and say, you know, we have thought through this and that the benefits in this situation clearly appear to outweigh the risks, then it's appropriate to do, and that's how we practice medicine. As we wrap up the show, I want to pose a question. Knowing what we've discussed about the differences between a box warning, a contraindication, and a general warning, do you agree with the decision to keep something like risk of death, a box warning for antipsychotics used to treat elderly patients with dementia? Sumatriptan can lead to a fatal myocardial infarction, but that's not a box warning for general users. And then we have tetrabenazine, which one randomized clinical trial reported one suicide event and one suicide attempt in patients assigned to treatment. And now tetrabenazine has a box warning for suicide risk. Is that legitimate enough to warrant a box warning? Consider sedation here. Sedation is the statistically significantly most common side effect of tetrabenazine that limits use and limits quality of life in Huntington patients. Why is sedation not more important for a box warning?
That wraps it up for another week of the Brainwaves podcast. Thanks for checking out our show. If you like what you heard, please rate the program on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. For related material, if you found this topic interesting, you might enjoy hearing Dr. Igor Ribinick talk about complications of medical treatment, episode 136, iatrogenesis, or an older program, episode 14, on anti-epileptic drug-drug interactions. And stay tuned for our second part of the series, It's Not Over Yet, on why an article published in JAMA or the New England Journal is not enough, why the conclusion paragraph of an abstract is hardly conclusive. Until then... The Brainwaves Podcast is produced out of Studio 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Jim Siegler, Senior Producer. Special thanks to Mike Rubenstein, as always, for his assistance with the production. And to Zachary Newcomer for telling the story of Sarah at the opening of the program. Music for this episode was courtesy of Cold Noise, Q-Cute, Dr. Turtle, Jazar, and Peter Rudinko. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeone. I'm Jim Siegler. Talk to you soon. <laughs>